Let's look at the Volkssturm, sometimes referred to as Hitler's militia. First off, let's clarify the name. It is usually translated with people's storm. Although since the word Volk has a strong national connotation, it might also be translated with national storm or even national assault. Since Sturmangriff means assault and Sturm was sometimes used as a short form for Sturmangriff. Now since we got that out of the way, what is the origin behind the Volkssturm? It was founded in September 1944, so after the destruction of Army Group Center by the Soviets in Operation Bagaton, the Allied landings in Normandy and the unsuccessful assassination attempt against Hitler. All these three happened in summer 1944. As such, the Volkssturm was the last ditch effort, an act of desperation. Yet it is a bit more complicated than that. First off, the Wehrmacht had requested several times before the creation of a civilian militia in order to deal with various issues. Already in 1941 there were so-called alarm companies created. Later the Stadt and Landwacht, literally city and country guard watch, which by the end of 1943 had 1 million members, were created, although only about 50% of them were armed. Second, in the logic of the Third Reich's leaders, the Volkssturm was actually seen as a way to change the course of the war. The Volkssturm, although clearly an improvisation in many of the details of its implementation, was part of a consistent, though ideologically influenced, strategy intended to turn the tide of the war in Germany's favor. This leads to the third point, that this was an organization of the party, not the German military. The July 20 plot destroyed any confidence the party leadership might have had in the Wehrmacht's abilities to head the war effort and confirmed Nazi suspicions that the Reich's reversal were due to defeatist, traitorous officers. The Reich certainly could not trust such unreliable men with the delicate task of forming a national militia. And fourth, the Volkssturm was about achieving the difficult balance between providing immediate manpower and defenses while at the same time keeping the production levels as high as possible. Now let's take a short look at the idea that the Volkssturm should have won the war. For most of us that sounds like a complete insane idea, and with the power of hindsight it clearly is. But you should not forget several aspects. First, in June 1944 the Wehrmacht suffered two major defeats, the invasion of Normandy and the destruction of Army Group Center. Yet after Normandy, the Germans fought tenaciously and for quite some time the Western Allies could not break out of more Normandy, something I covered in this video about hetero fighting. Similarly, a few months later Operation Market Garden also faced stiff German resistance and was unsuccessful. Second, the Western Allies assumed that by the end of 1944 the Wehrmacht would collapse. As such, it came quite as a shock when the Ardennes Offensive was launched, better known as the Battle of the Bulge. This is clearly reflected by both the US and British actions, to give just two examples. Robert Lovay, US Assistant Secretary of War for Air, recommended an expansion of the air war, arguing that if progress was not made quickly, it seems reasonable to assume that the war may develop into a type of dug-in trench warfare which will be slow, costly in lives and increasingly difficult to synchronize with the increased demands of isolated Pacific operations. Whereas the British, just a few days short of Christmas, began increasing their manpower at the front. And in what must have been a dreary Christmas present to the British people, the war cabinet announced on the 22nd December 1944 that it would add 250,000 to the ranks of Britain's soldiers by pulling behind the line men to the front, by transferring men from the Royal Air Force and other services and by combing more men out of civilian jobs. Furthermore, even the Soviets ran into manpower shortages in 1944. By the second half of 1944, the Red Army, and particularly the infantry, was suffering from acute manpower shortages. Those reserves that might have seemed almost bottomless in 1941 had proven otherwise, thanks to a large extent to the operational and operational strategic failures of Stalin and the High Command early in the war, and in particular during 1941-42. Thus, in some regions the conscription age was raised in October 1944 to up to 45 years of age for those who were not engaged in war production. As such, the Volkssturm had a strategic idea and logic behind it, as flawed as it might be. 
The leaders of the Third Reich, lacking objectivity and the luxury of hindsight, hoped to turn the tide by creating among all Germans a fanatical will to resist. This would enable them to force the Allies to fight bitterly for every German city, town and village, and thereby turn the war into a protracted stalemate. Such a struggle would maximize Allied casualties and minimize their territorial gain. Eventually, they expected the war weariness would wear down Allied morale and ultimately collapse Allied war effort. In effect, they hoped to replay the 1918 stab in the back scenario, only this time with the roles being reversed. Now let us look at the general structure of the Volkssturm. As mentioned before, the problem was balancing the needs of additional manpower for defense and keeping the production levels up. As such, the Germans devised a system that seemed very sound at first, namely the creation of four different Aufgebote, Levi's, to draw men from. Now it is very important to note that this system was used only internally. This categorization, however, should not appear externally. It was merely intended to determine the internal organization. The Volkssturm men of all orders were one, and the same for the public announcements, Volkssturm soldiers. The mention of the Levy was forbidden. So what about the four Levies? With the exception of the third Levy, the age range was 16 to 60 years, although this was defined by the years of birth in the original document, not the age itself. Let us start with the fourth Levi. To quote from the original text, the fourth Levi of the Volkssturm includes all those who are no longer fit for combat and can be used for guard and security duties. The third Levi was also called the HJ Levi, so the Hitler Youth Levi. It was for all born in 1928 to 1925. Since the document is from 1944, that means all 16 to 90 years old, as long as they were not already performing military service. Then there was the second Levi. Those were men aged 16 to 60 years that were employed in businesses essential for the war effort, communications, transport facilities, or other essential functions at the home front. As such, they would only serve close to their homes. Finally, the first Levi was defined as follows. The first Levi of the Volkssturm includes, as far as nothing else is determined in the following, all members of the age group 1928 to 1884 who are fit for combat operations and whose assignment is possible without endangering vital functions of their homeland. Note that Mays was not mentioned in this document, but it was mentioned in the original Erlass degree in September 1944. Now on paper, this looks like a simple solution, but in practice, it was not. In practice, these apparently simple assignments, particularly for the Levi's 1 and 2, proved the most time-consuming, divisive and intractable problems faced by local Volkssturm officials. One issue, of course, was to determine how a man was essential for the war effort or not. Furthermore, nearly every organization within the Third Reich was already competing for everyone out there. The system forced everyone in the Third Reich's fiercely competitive labor market to negotiate with the party chancellery over deferral quotas for these personnel. It is important to point out here that most men serving the function were old men and not children, according to Yelton. The problem is he refers to missing in action statistics in his argument, although the various other statistics he provides in his book would serve as a better example, at least in my opinion, but maybe I missed something. His table on age distribution of German civilian men liable for Volkssturm service gives 13.1% for the birth years 1928 to 1930, although take this number with a grain of salt, since the table contains a significant discussion. Another issue is that a lot of children were already serving in another way that made them exempt from Volkssturm service, for instance, Flakhelfer. So auxiliary troops that served in the anti-aircraft units, namely those were not part of the Volkssturm, neither were the men of the Reichsarbeitsdienst, the Reichsworker service. I personally assume that the collective memory with the association of Volkssturm with children likely stems from several factors. First, veterans likely referred to the most young soldiers as the Volkssturm at some point. Second, documentaries and media likely did the same. Third, in popular depictions, children are usually used, since everyone pretends to care about them, when there is something to gain, yet not when it comes to real action. After all, it is remember the children. Additionally, old men usually don't get as much sympathy points, as such the sympathy and shock value is also lower with them. Now in terms of organization, the largest unit size for the Volkssturm was the battalion which should have an authorized strength of around 576 for the 2nd Levi 
and 649 men for the first Levi. Note that these numbers are deducted from the equipment list and total number of men and battalions listed in the documents. The organization of the units was the same as a regular army unit. For instance, the squad consists of one squad leader and nine riflemen. So although they were officially seen as party units, the organization was that of the Wehrmacht, or better, the German army, which was a part of the Wehrmacht. In terms of ranks, the system was very simple. There were only five ranks. Volkssturmmann, Volkssturmmann, Gruppenführer, Squad Leader, Zugführer, Platoon Leader, Kompanieführer, Company Commander, Bataillonsführer, Battalion Commander. And speaking of public memory, it is also important that depictions of the Volkssturm in the English-speaking world are mostly from those serving on the Western Front. Now the basics, namely the structure, purpose and duties, were mostly the same in the East and the West. Yet despite these similarities, the Volkssturm record against the Soviets is glaringly better, a situation that stemmed from two factors. First, Western Volkssturm men generally lacked any strong desire to resist the Anglo-American forces. Second, the Wehrmacht in the Western Front took less extensive interest in the Volkssturm and devoted less attention to it than did Eastern commanders. This was of course due to a mixture of desperation by Volkssturm men themselves and also by the Wehrmacht, which in the East was thus more willing to provide support and integrate the Volkssturm units. Overall, the choices facing an Eastern Volkssturm men were not attractive. If he tried to avoid duty, particularly in fortresses, where there were few places to hide, he risked execution for desertion. Surrender meant their uncertain but reportedly brutal fate for either immediate execution or harsh conditions in a POW camp. The third option, reporting for duty and following orders, though unpleasant, at least gave some chance of survival, particularly if regular troops supported his unit. Furthermore, the social competition of Volkssturmmen on the East was likely also a factor, since many of them were farmers, shopkeepers or white-collar workers. Now how many served in the Volkssturm is hard to determine. Theoretically, it was a huge number, because in September 1944, a total of 13.3 million German men were working in the arms industry. Meanwhile, 11.2 million were members of the Wehrmacht. Yet Yelten estimates that the actually employed numbers are quite different. With East Prussian constituting 30% of all Eastern Volkssturm missing in actions, and an estimated 200,000 men serving in the East Prussia in January 1945, one can estimate that upwards of 650,000 Volkssturm men saw action on the Eastern Front. For the West, the number is likely far lower. Missing in action lists show only 19 battalions, fewer than 12,000 men, served long enough to acquire field postal numbers. And the list names only 590 men from 34 battalions and 246 communities as having ended up as missing in action. Thus, it would be surprising if the total number of Volkssturm men committed to combat for an extended period of time in the West exceeded 150,000, although this is little more than a guess. Of course, this is also related to the dire equipment situation, which we will discuss next. In terms of weapons and equipment, the situation was bad. Although in fall 1944 the monthly requirements for the Wehrmacht was 300,000 rifles, the arms industry was only able to produce 200,000 pieces of the 98 carbine. Nevertheless, some serious effort went into equipping the Volkssturm. For instance, Hitler personally allocated 13,000 rifles, 1,000 machine guns and 680 mortars. Quite often the Volkssturm was equipped with capture weapons, for instance Italian rifles. There were other initiatives as well. The most ambitious of these programs involved the so-called People's Rifles, Volksgewehre, simplified versions of standard firearms that could in theory be produced in approximately one-fourth the time in the smallest locksmith's shop or with voluntary factory overtime. Other measures were converting old Luftwaffe machine guns for infantry service, which were originally designed as defensive weapons in aircraft. When it came to uniforms, those were often various party uniforms that were dyed with Wehrmacht colors. In this way, dyeing with color M44, it was possible to equip almost all battalions called for the Wehrmacht deployment with uniforms, or by those of the party, the SA, SS and the National Socialist Motor Corps. Next is training or better the lack thereof, as you can imagine there were many issues here. First, there was no consensus originally on what the focus should be. Should it be on marksmanship, so anti-infantry training, or should it be focused on anti-tank training? Second, there was another problem, for instance with the first Levi that was used only in local defense since it was active in essential industries and thus 
their training time was severely limited as a result of long working hours, which in the armament industry were up to 78 hours a week, only Sundays were available for practical weapons and combat training. The training duty on Sundays was not to exceed 6 hours, including the march to and from home. Third, then there was of course a lack of training personnel, equipment and regulations. There were of course exceptions like the leaflet what everybody needs to know about the Panzerfaust. One author notes that the armor regulations had to be adapted specifically for the Volkssturm and it was not allowed to provide the various subordinate leaders with these regulations in written form. Additionally, the Ministry of Propaganda provided seven training movies like Panzerfaust, Snipers, Close Combat School, Orientation Without Map and Compass and probably the most inspiring title Entrenching During Combat, Eingraben im Gefecht. Unsurprisingly, in spite of every effort, however, the Volkssturm generally failed to meet its training objectives. One problem was the sheer enormity of the task. And since it's almost Christmas, let us wander off a bit into wishful thinking and as such here are some essential parts from the Ausbildungsbefehl, the training order from October 1944 for the Volkssturm. Number 5. The training on the rifle shall achieve complete mastery of the weapon and accurate fire up to 150 meters. The focus here is on marksmanship training. It should be relocated early on into the field. Number 6. The training on the light machine gun has the goal of full control of this weapon. The gunner must be trained to fire short bursts. Number 7. The training on the light mortar has the goal of complete control of the equipment. Number 8. Training with hand grenades should train the Volkssturmen in high, low and target throwing in close combat. Number 9. The training in anti-tank combat includes the complete mastery of the Panzerfaust as well as training in the other means of close combat against tanks. Number 11. The instruction with the submachine gun, the pistol and laying or picking up of mines shall give the Volkssturmen a knowledge about the corresponding equipment so that he can use it in an emergency. Now there's a bit of a twist, since originally a Volkssturm should have been a militia that should have been outside the control of the Wehrmacht due to the distrust of the party leadership. Yet since the party failed in providing nearly everything, well, it went to the Wehrmacht. This assistance carried an unanticipated cost. However, for although the Wehrmacht never posed a threat to the NSDAP's political control, it did come to dominate the Volkssturm military issues. To conclude, the Volkssturm is far more interesting than it seems at first glance. Of particular interest is the fact that Hitler and the party throughout the war opposed the creation of a militia that the army requested several times. This is not without irony if we consider that once the Volkssturm was created in 1944, the missions assigned to it were extensive, while the material support and training capacities were extremely limited. Combined with the fact that it was a party organization, yet in the end the army had to do most of the work. As such, a more limited and early creation of a similar militia under the direction of the army likely would have been more effective and produced better results, especially considering that a handful of Volkssturm units were quite successful. Well, I hope you learned something new. I wish you a Merry Christmas and a Metal New Year. Thanks to Michael here for gifting me Yelton's book that was crucial for making this video. Also a big thank you to all my supporters on Patreon and Subscribestar. As always, source the link in the description. Thank you for watching and see you next time.